Hi, this is John Harcher, and welcome to episode 10.2 of Left Turn at Albuquerque. This is part two of our look at the Bugs Bunny 80th anniversary set, or our version of it, expanded from 60 to 80 shorts. We'll have a look at the next 20, which will take us from mid-1948 through mid-1953. We added six cartoons to the set last time. We'll do that one better and add seven more into the mix here. I knew I should have made a left turn at Albuquerque. I knew I should have taken that left turn at Albuquerque. I knew I should have taken that left turn at Albuquerque. I should have turned left at Albuquerque. Before we get back to the cartoons, just a word on the commentaries. I only pointed out one last episode. It was for Hold the Lion, Please, which was a new one on digital. I'll try to stick to just mentioning the new commentaries. If one carries over from the Golden Collections, like a number did from last time, I'll deal with them there. Now, next episode, we'll have some upgrades from the Superstars disc, uh, but they didn't include any commentaries. They're kind of like the Collector's Choice discs. So I will talk about those. Now, those commentaries, as well as the ones on this disc, and likely the ones for Hold the Lion, Please, were brand newly recorded for this set. Viewer Hatch Tunes over at the Hoffman Boards helped me find out this bit of info, so thanks to him, you know me, always want to be comprehensive. So let's get right back into our next series of tunes for our hypothetical disc two. Hair Devil Hair was released on July 24th, 1948. This is another across-the-board entry. It was on both Golden and Platinum Collection Volume 1s and The Essential Bugs Bunny. It's the first Marvin and first K-9 and was actually the last cartoon included in the AAP package. As I mentioned back in Episode 2, Channel 5 didn't show this cartoon until the 80s, at least from what I saw. Who knows? Channel 9 may have shown it. Next is Hot Cross Bunny, released on August 21st, 1948, directed by Robert McKimson and written by Warren Foster. It makes its digital debut here. Bugs is the patient in an experimental hospital where a doctor tries to transfer his brain to a chicken. This is the more jowly Bugs McKimson intended for. He's also kind of a little short. Now this is where the network tunes start coming into play. It was probably the oldest one in the network rotation, at least as far as Bugs Bunnies go. As such, this was a definite Saturday morning one from ABC. It was surely on CBS as well, I just don't really remember it. Bugs does his Lionel Barrymore impression here. From the mayor of the town, the gentlemen of the jury, you can't send that poor boy to prison. And this little dancing bit was the same animation from Bugs Bunny Rides Again, and it wouldn't be the last time it showed up. Restoration is clean, but a little on the grainy side. Hair Splitter was released on September 25th, 1948, directed by Frizz Freeling and written by Ted Pierce. Another digital debut, this one has Bugs and his rival Casbah trying to take out Daisy Lou. Bugs decides to pull a fast one on him and dresses up as Daisy Lou while she's out. Could Casbah really not tell the difference? Surprise, it's not more celebrated these days for reasons. This was a syndicated one, though as noted, the AAP package had ended with the, the cartoons from a few months earlier. Now this is officially the only appearance of Daisy Lou, though it may be an open question if she's the one who becomes Mrs. Bugs Bunny at the end of Hold the Lion, Please. What would Lola say? Crystal clear restoration here. Now we come to our first edition on the disc, and it's the one that doesn't have a digital version available at all, so I'm using a VHS copy here. Aladdin His Lamp was released on October 23, 1948, directed by McKimson and written by Foster. Bugs finds Aladdin's lamp, but the genie really doesn't want to be bothered with all that wish granting stuff. Then the rabbit has to keep the lamp out of the hands of Hassan Pfeffer. Get it? Hassan Pfeffer, Hassan Pfeffer, the rabbit dish. Anyway, what makes this cartoon so significant is it's the only major appearance in a Warner Brothers cartoon of one of the most famous voices in all of popular culture. You hear this voice. I'm here, I'm here. Let the bells ring out and the banners fly. Feast your eyes on me. It's too good to be true, but I'm here. And you immediately know who it is. Mr. Magoo and Thurston Howell himself, Jim Backus. 
Backus had been working in radio since 1940, but this was his first big screen appearance of any kind. Of course, he's uncredited due to Mel's agreement, but there was no mistaking that voice for anyone else. By the next year, he'd begun doing the Magoo shorts over at UPA, and his path towards immortality was set. So why is this not on digital video already? Setting, perhaps? Uh, don't know. But this should have a very high position in getting on to the next Looney Tunes release, whatever it is. We move on to 1949 in the next edition of the set, Bowery Bugs, released on June 4th of that year. It's the only Bugs Bunny short directed by Art Davis. Now, his usual writers, Lloyd Turner and Bill Scott, are credited, but Scott was on the record as saying he didn't remember working on this cartoon at all. The Bowery Bugs is a new twist on the old story of Steve Brody's jump off the Brooklyn Bridge, driven to insanity by thinking everyone's a rabbit. Rabbits! Everybody's a rabbit! Billy Bletcher does Brody going from tough guy to complete crack up. What's up, Derek? What's up, Derek? From time to time on Channel 5, it looked like something got edited out, but when I saw the whole thing, I guess they just had a bad copy. This was on Golden Collection Volume 3, and with it being the only Davis-directed Bugs, it should be on blue already. It's back on Max. To be honest, doesn't look much different than the DVD version. Happens sometimes. Next is Nights Must Fall, released on July 16, 1949, directed by Chris Freeling and written by Ted Pierce. It's another digital debut. This is the first of Bugs' trips to medieval times, this time getting involved with a knight and a jousting contest. Now, the bomber contraption uh, towards the end is pretty inventive. Now, this is a network one and wasn't Frizz's last trip to medieval times as well. Restoration is clean, but there's a lot of spotty cells on this one. It's on to a new decade with What's Up Doc, released on June 17, 1950, directed by Robert McKimson and written by Warren Foster. It's a blue debut for this one from Golden Collection, Volume 1. An early life of Bugs cartoon that takes the bunny through his travails on his way up the showbiz ladder. The chorus section... Oh, we are the boys of chorus, we, we hope you like our show. show. We, we know, know you're rooting for, for us, but now we have to go. Is a possible inspiration for a bit in Singing in the Rain as well as Sven's closer after the movie on MeTV on Saturday nights. There's the great gag where Bugs is down and out with all the other performers who are very familiar to those from back then. You have Al Jolson, Jack Benny, Eddie Cantor, and McCrosby. This is another one that was on Saturday mornings. Often, we mentioned back in episode one that the music from the opening of The Unruly Hair provided the basis for the title song. Hey, what's up, Doc? What's cooking? What's up, Doc? That music then went on to become a sort of secondary theme for the Bugs Bunny shorts from this point on through the mid-50s. <laughs> kind of surprised it wasn't on the essential Bugs Bunny, We'll fix that later in the summer. Like the last one, the characters are clean, background cells, body. The next two are definite classics and have done the trifecta, appearing on the Golden Collections, Platinum Collections, and Essential Bugs Bunny, and we talked about both back in Episode 2. 8-Ball Bunny was released on July 8, 1950, originally on Golden Collection Volume 4 and Platinum Collection Volume 1. One thing that always gets pointed out when people talk about this is how accurate Bugs' trip is to get the penguin back home. It also helped drill the point into our heads as kids that penguins came from the... Chapeau! Ooh, I'm dying! Being from North Jersey, I knew they don't normally come from... Hoboken! Next is The Rabbit Seville, released on December 16th, 1950, from Golden Collection Volume 1 and Platinum Collection Volume 1, as well as The Essential. Huh, I knew Maltese was Italian. One quick note about this since we've done it, the outdoor theater here isn't the Hollywood Bowl, but the Greek theater on the other side of L.A. It's a bit more out in the country to accommodate for rabbits and hunters being so close to the venue. A big year is up next. 
Rabbit Every Monday was released on February 10th, 1951, directed by Fritz Freeling and written by him as well, as near as anyone can figure. We got a digital debut here. Sam wants something to eat so he catches bugs, but has a hard time getting them into the oven. Greg Ford does a commentary here and mentions that this cartoon sort of harkens back to the late 30s absurdism. They even resurrect the guy in the audience gag that they used a bunch of times back then. Not only is this a network short, but it was actually the very first network short showing up on the first episode of the Primetime Bugs Bunny show on October 11, 1960 on ABC. And it remained there until the Cartoon Network day. Restoration is flat out terrific on this one. The Fair Haired Hair was released on April 14, 1951, also directed by Freeling, but written by uh, Warren Foster. It's another Bugs and Sam digital debut. Sam builds his house over Bugs' hull, so the rabbit takes him to court, where the judge decides they have to share the house. Some interesting gags in this one, like the highest court, and a lot of the stuff towards the end where Sam tries to take his wrath out on Bugs. Constantin Nasser provides the commentary on this one, and it's definitely a new one for this set. He mentions the documentary he made for it that we'll deal with in episode 10.4. Another network short, Restoration is nice, but less crisp than the last one. Rapid Fire came out on May 19, 1951. You knew this one would be across the board. Golden Collection Volume 1, Platinum Collection Volume 2, and Essential Bugs Bunny. No doubt why it's here. Duck season! Season. Duck season. Season. His Hair Raising Tale was released on August 11th, 1951. Another digital debut. This one's a rarity in this era for Bugs, the compilation cartoon. Popeye had done a bunch and Tom and Jerry did a couple, but Looney Tunes really wouldn't do them until the late 50s and 60s, though we'll get to a mid-50s one coming up soon. Freeling and Foster did the interconnecting parts. This one also introduces Bugs' nephew, Clyde, which begs the question, does Bugs have a brother or a sister? The tunes that have sections included are Baseball Bugs, Stage Door Canteen, Rabbit Punch, Falling Hair, and Hair Devil Hair. As I mentioned, this one was in syndication along with all the shorts included, though of course I didn't see Hair Devil until much later. Very even restoration between the new material and the older shorts really consistent looking. Our last cartoon for 1951 is an addition. Big Top Bunny was released on December 1st, 1951, directed by Robert McKimson and written by Ted Pierce. Bugs ends up in a battle with Bruno the Bear over who's the star of the show. Now, this one on TV was an oddity. When I was up in Wallington, it was on quite a bit. When I moved to Monroe, I didn't see it the rest of the 70s. It would show up again around the time Hair Devil Hair came on. The reason I wanted to see it again was because I'd seen it as a selection for the GAF Talking Viewmaster. For those of you younger than 50 or so, the Viewmaster was a thing where you were able to watch scenes from either nature or movies or cartoons on these little discs that had pictures on either side that was such a way that it looked like they were in 3D. They also had one that had a sound component. Now, I didn't have it, but I saw an end cap in the old two guys over in Garfield, right off of Sake Avenue there, that had the talking Viewmaster on display, and one of the sets they had with it was for this cartoon. Now, I could have sworn this shot was on the cover, but as you can see, this one is right there. Now, this probably should have been on here since Acrobati Bunny was on Platinum Collection Volume 3, it's still waiting for a blue upgrade, though it's currently on max in HD and a nice restoration at that. Another addition as we move into a new year, this one might be a bit of a stretch, but hey, I'm doing this set. 14 Carat Rabbit came out on March 15, 1952, directed by Fritz Freeling and written by Warren Foster. Bugs gets a funny feeling whenever he's near gold, so Sam tries to exploit it and, as usual, ends up paying for it. Some well-tested gags throughout this one, Frizz knew them well, plus an ending that's similar to the Abbott and Costello film Coming Around the Mountain, which may have come out right around when this short was in production. And Frizz complained about stealing. I'm still trying to find out why, if the story took place in a Klondike, why is Sam called... Chillicoot Sam! Yeah, Chillicoot Sam! What does the city in Ohio have to do with it? 
Anyway, this was on Golden Collection Volume 5 as a lead-off tune. It's on max at the moment. Restoration is about the level of fair-haired hair. This one's kind of a personal privilege. I think of this as part of a loose trilogy with the two Bug Sam ones from 1951. If you prefer a different one in this slot, hey, I'm all for it. As we move further into 1952, we're going to do two more editions. Both of them were on Golden Collection Volume 1 and both on Disc 1, though in the reverse order that they came out, and both were syndicated. They're also now both on Max and HD, decent restoration with some debris. First is Water, Water, Every Hair, released on April 19, 1952, directed by Chuck Jones and written by Michael Maltese. Bugs gets flooded out of his hole and ends up at a mad scientist castle. John T. Smith does the voice of the scientist as a definite caricature of the guy Chuck would get to do the Grinch a decade and a half later. My baby. My mechanical masterpiece. This is also the second appearance of the monster that became known as Gossamer. Why they change it in the Duck Dodgers one from 1980, I have no idea. He's got a name here. Come, Rudolph. The monster gets another trip to the stylist, and the college kids love the part with the ether. Come back here, you rabbit. Chuck and the boys had some fun with all that water, like the segment where Bugs takes a drink while underwater. Also, it's one of his earliest cinematic tunes, you know, the castle by the waterfall is pretty impressive. A part of this was used for the opening of Channel 5's Bugs Bunny show for quite a while. What's up, Doc? What's going on around here? Where Where am I anyway? Now, this is one of the ones that probably should have been included. Now, if they had, they could have left off Hair Raising Hair since it was on Platinum Collection Volume 3. Since they included that, I'm okay with adding the one more double dip at the end of this quote-unquote disc. The other edition is Rabbit's Kin, released on November 15, 1952, directed by Robert McKimson and written by Ted Pierce. Bugs and a little brown rabbit run into Pete Puma. That's all that needs to be said. <coughs> one of McKimson's best tunes, he normally had Bugs go up against some one-off character, but Stan Freeberg's Pete made such an impression in his only appearance, we'd imitate him all the time in high school, especially Pete's last lines. Uh, by the way, how many lumps do you want? Oh, better give me a lot of lumps. A whole lot of lumps. Oh, no, you don't. I'll help myself. Back to the box with Hairlift, released on December 20th, 1952. Gift wrap would have been nice to release on this date, but it had already been out for 10 months. Hairlift was directed by Fritz Freeling and written by Warren Foster. This is its digital debut. Sam robs a bank and hides out in a plane Bugs is taking an impromptu tour of. Lots of similar gags to Falling Hair. In fact, I thought during the Falling Hair scenes from his hair-raising tale that they came from this short, which would have been odd with it being released over a year earlier. <laughs> But that turned out to be new footage. I AP'd it. This is another one from Syndication. Restoration is on the fair-haired hair, 14-carat rabbit level. On to a new year. Upswept Hair was released on March 4th, 1953, directed by McKimson and written by Pierce. Yep, digital debut here. Elmer digs up a desert plant to bring to into his penthouse, unaware Bugs has his hole in its native soil. This is another one from Syndication. Now... There's a flaw in the tune, at least in the new mastering. There are two slight skips while Bugs is singing in the pool. It wasn't present in the print on Boomerang a little while ago, but as of now, it has the flawed sound. Now, I was able to fix this pretty easily, thanks to an older copy on YouTube. Hopefully, at some point, Warners will as well. Don't know if it's worth the space on a collection for it, but you know, you can be put up on streaming. Now, if you've noticed over the episodes, 1953 is one of the best-looking years overall for, like, any of the Looney Tunes, and this one is no exception, very clear. Our last one in this episode is my Blu-ray double dip, Bully for Bugs, released on August 3rd, 1953. Like I said, if hair-raising hair had been left off in favor of water, water, 
I probably would have left this one off. But to make it an even dozen double dips, I'll include it. One quick thing to add in the later network years, they'd end up cutting the part where the bull swallows the gun. Apparently it was too violent. Yeah, like if a bull swallows a gun, he's going to fire bullets out of his horns. Uh-huh. Jeez. So we're halfway through our look at the box and a little over that in Bugs' theatrical career in the Golden Age. We've done the bulk of our added cartoons on the past two discs. The next two will have three and four, respectively, matching the disc numbers. It just works out that way. Uh, before we go, quick boomerang update. If you looked at the schedule at first glance, it appears stuff just shows up whenever, kind of the way it was when we were kids. But if you look a little closer at the cartoons and the way that they run, they're kind of mixing the alphabetical run with a chronological order, but not totally. At the 6 a.m. hour, you get a general chronological run of cartoons from whatever year. Then into 6 to 8 block at night, or 1 to 3 on the weekends, they might do like 90 minutes of chronological, and then a half hour of alphabetical, but you know backwards, slightly out of order. You know, it's, <laughs> doesn't totally make sense, but I guess they know what they're doing. So it's a good thing we did the recap when we did, so we could follow what everything was. And by the way, since we did that, Two more shorts have been added into the rotation. Putty Tat Trouble was added over Memorial Day weekend, though I think it would have been a good Christmas one because it takes place in the snow. And Daffy Doodles was added the first weekend in June. We did that one back all the way in episode one. Come on, Boomerang, let's see if you can get it up to 250 cartoons. Next time, we'll go through the era of mid-1953 to mid-1958 with a heavy freeling concentration. I'm John Hunter. Thanks for watching.